returning uh, your papers uh, to you. The email, uh, if you didn't read the email, please do, because there are some notes in that email about uh, certain notations used in the, in the papers that, were, that are going to be returned to you. Um, and I'll take a few minutes, just a few minutes, before I return them to talk to you very briefly uh, about a number of uh, questions that emerge uh, f uh, after reading the papers. Uh, so the agenda for today uh, is I want to just take a few minutes on this issue over here because recall the segment that we had been talking about. We had been speaking about, uh, you know, I'm going back two, three lectures. We had started with the Dalits. Uh, we had looked at various ameliorative measures that have been undertaken in India to improve the condition of the Dalits, um, including, of course, legislative measures. And then I had spoken to you about, uh, obviously, such things as uh, the policy of reservations and, and uh, how Dalits have or have not, according to some, been able to improve their position uh, by being able to, uh, in some ways, um, insert themselves into the public sphere in, in India, uh, for example, at the polls. Uh, what difference the Dalits might have made to electoral results. Uh, and for those of you who have uh, been keeping up or not keeping up perhaps with uh, the elections, you know that the elections have been concluded, I mean, and the results will be announced on, uh, on Thursday, uh, uh, which would be uh, uh, Wednesday night over here, tomorrow night over here. Um, and I won't speak about that, but perhaps on Thursday, uh, uh, depending on what the outcome is, I might take a few minutes to talk to you about uh, the election results uh, in India. Uh, and then from there, from the Dalits, we had moved to the question of Adivasis. Uh, and again, looked at some ameliorative measures, but also looked at forms of resistance. Uh, and then we moved to the whole question of um, uh, migrants and workers, um, in, in Indian cities, and, and I made several uh, observations about that, pointing out that uh, we would also have to bring, uh, within that discussion, we'd have to bring into consideration such things as overseas Indian populations. Um, I recall having shared with you some data, uh, for example, about the um, money that is the remittances, as they're called, that have been sent uh, back to India by Indians living overseas, particularly in, in the Gulf region, uh, as well as the United States. Uh, but I want to uh, look at this in particular, uh, because this is, of course, something that uh, you know, ought to be a source of extraordinary uh, shame and embarrassment for the country. I'm not sure it frankly is. Uh, I don't really see much discussion of it. Uh, in India, I mean, if, if, you, if I say if India is viewed as an open defecation capital of the world, that's certainly not any kind of tourist advertisement for the country, uh, as you can imagine. Um, and I know, by the way, I mean, I've been told this a few times because I've, I've offered this course before. Uh, last time was five years ago. Uh, there are some people in India who told me that I shouldn't be speaking about such things in a, in a foreign country because it makes India look bad. Uh, you know, uh, but uh, we have to contend with the realities for what they are. Um, and uh, the fact of the matter is, I mean, I, I don't know if you remember, there was an article of, uh, on this subject that was assigned to you earlier on um, in the syllabus uh, by Gardner Harris, uh, where he speaks about uh, this particular subject. Um, and uh, if you look at today's New York Times, uh, astonishingly enough, so the front page is an article on Mr. Modi, on Narendra Modi, and it says that one of his successes uh, certainly seems to be in, being, uh, the installation of 100 million toilets uh, in India. It says that uh, on the front page of the New York Times today. You know, uh, now uh, uh, that claim is, by the way, is really questionable. Uh, it's it's questionable uh, not because these 100 million toilets have not been built; they may have been built. Uh, but the question is, how many of them are actually being used? Uh, the, the data doesn't tell you that. Um, and it doesn't tell you uh, uh, of how many uh, are not simply being used, but how many are actually being cleaned. Because, of course, you know, there, there are major activists in India that I've spoken to uh, who tell me that building more toilets is actually the worst possible thing in India. Uh, and, you know, when you hear it the first time, you get really surprised. Uh, until you begin to reflect on what they're saying, because uh, 
you know, if they're going to build 100 million toilets, uh, public toilets, that is, uh, or toilets in public institutions such as schools, uh, and it's been argued that it's very important in particular to build them uh, in schools because one reason why girls in particular don't go to schools uh, in rural parts of India is because there are no toilets at these schools. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, when you hear a, a major activist say that these toilets is a, are a problem, the reason for that is that once you build these toilets, it is unquestionably the case that you're going to expect a Dalit to clean these toilets, right? And so therefore, of course, it reinforces that very system which led to there not being toilets in the first place. It, it, it leads to a reinscription of the idea of who the Dalits are. Because if you're going to build 100 million toilets, I can tell you, you're not going to get 100 million Brahmins or 100 million upper caste in India who are going to take care of these toilets. Right? And so these problems are not going to be resolved overnight simply by building 100 million toilets. And that, as I said, this is all aside from the question whether they actually are 100 million, whether you know it's just a hole in the wall, I mean, in the ground. Uh, you know, or whether these are real toilets, whether these are flush toilets. I'm not even getting into all of these, you know, details at this point in time. I'm simply saying that one would have to think through what exactly this is. Now, uh, this is a question that has, has persisted uh, in India for a long period of time. Uh, and again, I want to reinforce the, something, and I do this because I think we should be certain, on the one hand, that we don't exoticize India, uh, and on the other hand, we don't minimize the problem. So when I say we don't exoticize, this problem of what to do with human excreta is a problem that has faced every civilization until quite recently. All right? Until quite recently. You know, Leo Tolstoy, shortly before he passed away. So I was reading about him because uh, uh, I don't know how many of you are aware of the fact that that for two years before his death, he entered into a correspondence with Mahatma Gandhi. It's one of the most unusual chapters in intellectual history of the world, uh, the very short correspondence they had. But they did. And what's extraordinary is that one of the letters that, that Tolstoy writes to Gandhi in 1908, 1909, is a letter where he says that a civilization cannot be considered advanced if someone expects someone else to take his his chamber pot, okay, outside the home. Right? Unless you do that work yourself, you cannot be considered a liberated advanced civilization. Now, he was saying that in 1909, because of course at this point in time, flush toilets were still relatively uncommon. The WC, water closet as it's called. And in all societies, this was a fundamental problem. Now in many societies, this problem has been resolved. Uh, through the use of technology, you could say, all right? and through various kinds of uh, mechanisms that have been devised, including how we think about the organization of human societies and the organization of human labor. And one of the reasons this has not been resolved in India, most people would say, has to do with the institution of caste. Right? That, that so long as you have a caste system and so long as you have a group, group of people known as the Dalits, uh, because what is the argument? The argument here is that why are these people still being used, right? So if you remember this over here, the slide that I showed you the other day, right? Why are these people going down into the drain? Because the argument would be, I mean, you know, this is the argument from obviously from political economy, uh, is that it's that so long as human labor is cheap, therefore these people will continue to do this and the state is not going to use machinery Right? which is what they really do in most countries of the world. Right? That's basically the, the nuts and bolts argument for this. But there are fundamental uh, issues about whether this is not only <coughs> uh, degrading to, to Dalits uh, and to low caste people in general, but whether it's also obviously in some ways a fundamental human rights abuse. And the minute we say that, then we have to of course start thinking about, well, what is this conception of human rights? Uh, what do we mean by human rights? Where, you know, does human do human rights include the right to clean air? Uh, 
for example, because if human rights include that as well, then obviously a huge number of people, uh, human rights are being violated in India, right? Uh, 14 out of the 20 most polluted cities in the world, according to the most recent study by the United Nations, are in India. Right? So we can go down this particular road and we will keep on coming to these kinds of questions. Uh, but I'm saying that the modern, that the state in India now has committed itself at some, uh, at some level, uh, at some official level to, to building these toilets, but I don't think enough thought has been given to exactly whether this problem will be resolved or whether in some particular way it might actually be, be uh, aggravated, uh, unless there is a systematic thinking about the nature of human, the nature of Indian society and the nature of the hierarchies in that particular society, right? So if you look at all of these, if you look at the data over here, at the end of 2018, according to official statistics, 89% of the country had access to a toilet as opposed to 40% in 2014. Um, sometimes, yes. In, in, in Pakistan, there has been there there is a literature which points to the fact that the problem persists in Pakistan, but to a lesser degree than in India. In in Bangladesh, uh, you know, if you if you're really looking at these three countries, they really, in most respects, are fundamentally similar. We're going to find out that that Bangladesh, for example, has moved ahead of both Pakistan and India on certain. Um, development indices, for example. You know, I'm, I'm going to be speaking very shortly about uh, something called the female-male ratio. Uh, and if you look at the female-male ratio, you're going to find, so if you look on the top of that, uh, if you can, I don't know if you can, can you read this, uh, those of you at the back? Well, you'll have the slide with you later on. But uh, Bangladesh is 162. On the female-male ratio, uh, Pakistan is 184. So Bangladesh is 22 stops ahead. That is that its female-male ratio is better now. Um, and, and when Amartya Sen wrote the book from which pages were assigned to you for this, for this segment uh, on having to do with women, uh, that book goes back to about 20, 25 years ago. Uh, Pakistan was worse off than India on the female-male ratio, but now it's better. It's 184. Not that it's anything to be proud of, uh, because you're still way down the ladder. And India is down to 191. Uh, on the female male ratio okay so the answer to your question is that number one uh, that if we broaden it out we because we could of course ask the same question about all of the other issues we're talking about female male ratio literacy rates how do Pakistan and Bangladesh compare to India and the answer is that we that by and large what I've been arguing about particularly with these matters the indices will put all of these countries more or less together, except that in some respects, Bangladesh has moved ahead, okay, uh, than Pakistan and India. Uh, although, if you're looking at it from the point of view of political rights, uh, uh, at the present moment, Bangladesh has no advantage over India or Pakistan, even remotely. Uh, I would say that political rights are extremely precarious uh, in, in Bangladesh. There have been uh, last several years, there were a large number of bloggers who were hacked to pieces, okay? Um, and the most recent election, which was concluded only, by the way, uh, two, three months ago uh, in Bangladesh, uh, saw uh, the woman who won at Sheikh Hasina get a 98.5% of the popular vote. I mean, they don't even make an attempt to disguise it. You know, some countries make an attempt, right? Uh, but on this particular issue, uh, we find that, the, that, that for various reasons in, in Pakistan, the problem is not as acute, but there is a literature which suggests that, in fact, there are people who are being sent down into drains uh, over there as well, you know, okay? Uh, let me just, I don't know how this came up, one second. Um, yeah, okay. So, um, and you know, we, we, will get, we will get back to this, this uh, issue uh, of female-male ratio uh, later on. Uh, but uh, I also want to alert you to the fact that there may be, there may be interesting uh, ways in the popular imagination to talk about it. So there is a film that came out uh, 
uh, very recently. Uh, it's only about uh, two years ago. Uh, I think I may have the, the name um, wrong just a bit, but it's called, uh, I think it's called uh, Toilet Ek Prem Katha. Uh, so Toilet Ek, Ek Prem Katha is Toilet, a love story. So this is a, uh, a, a, a couple who basically have to meet in the toilet of a railway, of a train. Uh, and, that's, uh, and the reason why they do that is because, well, actually, she doesn't have a toilet in her home. So she has to, she, the, one of the places where she goes to uh, a toilet is a train. So, you know, she arrives at a railway a railway station, the train pulls up, and then she goes into that train, not because she's taking a ride on the train as such, but only because she has to use uh, a toilet, has access to, uh, have access to a toilet. Uh, and there's been a considerable literature on the fact that uh, in many of these rural areas of India, uh, uh, women will very often wake up at 4 a.m. in the morning so that they can go and relieve themselves out in the open. Um, and uh, one, of the, one of the concerns is that when they go alone, uh, they may be subject to a sexual assault, you know. Uh, so there are all kinds of other issues which are tied up with this uh, whole problem that we have to really think about. Uh, now, the, so very recently, they launched what is called the Swachh Bharat campaign. This was uh, Swachh Bharat is Clean India, uh, and uh, the 457 districts have been declared to be open defecation free. That is, that there's no open defecation. Uh, again, I, I frankly have my doubts uh, that this is the case. Uh, I think that if you look at the literature uh, coming out from social activists, it's quite different. Uh, and once again, the point that I have made many times before, I want to reinforce it yet again, um, namely that you know it's not that India doesn't have the legislation. We we have to really constantly remember this, that there is legislation, for example, which actually uh, prohibits. Uh, what is called manual scavenging. Uh, you know, when you first uh, encounter that phrase, one doesn't even know what exactly it means. I, mean, I remember encountering it 40 years ago and having to sort of look up a number of works to understand uh, what it really meant. Uh, but manual scavenging can mean a number of different things, but principally it, re it really refers to the phenomenon of people being hired uh, to uh, uh, go and clean out uh, uh, toilets and to deal with the problem of human excreta. Uh, and 2013, you had another act. So, you know, these acts are constantly reinforced. The prohibit, prohibition of employment as manual scavengers and the Rehabilitation Act. And, you know, in, in this respect, the Indian state is forward looking. Uh, they pass the legislation, they even actually introduce a whole provision about rehabilitation. Because if you've read this uh, PDF that was attached, you know that there are some very interesting arguments that they, they distinguish between different kinds. Uh, of people involved in this, and that some of the people who are involved in it are actually employees of the state. Uh, they have uh, permanent security of employment. Uh, that if you speak to these people, uh, very often they'll tell you that we don't want our children to do this kind of work, obviously. And then when you speak to the children, the children say, well, yeah, but you know, this, is, it, this gives us security of employment. Uh, I mean, a government job is still highly valued, even if it doesn't pay very much, because I think, as I've mentioned to you before, uh, one assurance you have is that you can almost never be dismissed from a government job in India, you know. Um, and, 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 and for this kind of work, again, there is a gender division of labor. Uh, so I don't have to go into all the details, because if you look at the PDF, it sort of makes very clear what some of these, uh, these uh, uh, issues are. But you know, at some level, you have to think to yourself fundamentally, what is really happening in a country which is claiming to be a world power, uh, a country which is a space power, is a nuclear power, and at some fundamental level is unable to resolve what seem to be the most fundamental elementary questions of human dignity. I mean, that I think is the question that you really have to put to yourself. I'm not here entering into, by the way, a very different kind of meta discourse about whole questions of touch, uh, questions of pollution, um, and you know how these are configured in the Indian imagination, because we would have to really enter into questions of metaphysics uh, and then try to understand whether there's a very different way of reading, uh, for example, uh, something called caste. Uh, that's not something that can be attempted uh, you know, given the confines of this particular course. Okay, now, um, 
By the way, here's a question for you, um, and uh, it could be a series of questions if you have them. So one of the things that was assigned to you was um, this book, and I sent you an email saying that you know you must take you must read this book, uh, even though it's a novel. Don't assume that simply because it's a novel, it's been given merely for your pleasure. It is for your pleasure, uh, but it is for but but it is a, a work that gives us certain insights uh, into the human condition in India. It gives us insights into people who work. Uh, as wage laborers who work uh, as maid, uh, as um, uh, maid servants, uh, housekeepers, drivers, uh, uh, much much of this labor force is what is called the unorganized labor force uh, in India. Uh, in fact, that's the bulk of it. One of the things that's happened in India uh, is the decrease in labor union membership. This, of course, is a worldwide problem because if you look at the United States. Uh, shortly after the end of uh, the Second World War, uh, we're talking about uh, um, a labor uh, union membership which was uh, uh, upwards of 30 percent. Uh, and today it's less than 10 percent in the United States. Right? So there's been a so there's, there, there are a number of reasons why labor unions have declined. There's also been a systematic attack on labor unions uh, from various sectors of society, uh, particularly, of course, uh, capitalists uh, and corporations. Um, um, with the connivance of the state, I would argue, and that's certainly the case in India as well. But the problems of most of these people that we're speaking about in India are compounded uh, by the fact that this is uh, the unorganized labor sector, which means, of course, that they don't have any, they don't have any uh, guarantees of employment, and of course they have nothing that remotely resembles what you would describe as health insurance. Right? Okay? Um, uh, and the only way to enter into that universe uh, is either through this kind of literature or what you might describe as anecdotally. You know. So for example, you know, the neighborhood where I have <coughs> an apartment uh, in, in Delhi, uh, uh, you know, almost every family there employs what's called a driver. Uh, uh, there is a distinction, by the way, between a driver and a chauffeur, uh, and uh, because a driver is a jack of all trades. That their, in other words, their task is to drive a car. But uh, you know, if you're like my mother's driver, who basically goes out only for you know two hours in a week at her age, but still has a driver, then the driver does all the other things. You know, fixes the light bulbs. You know, cleans the air conditioner. Uh, right. That's what I mean. Jack of all trades. Uh, now you know it, 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 you have to really anecdotally know how this this world survives, because uh, uh, most of these people uh, are, to the extent that they have health uh, coverage, which they never do, but uh, officially, but unofficially, it simply means that you know my driver will go to my mother when he's not well, uh, and she'll dig out medicines from her medicine chest and and hand them out to him. Or she'll call up her doctor and say, you know, I'm going to send my doctor, send my driver to you, and do you think you could look at him, and you know, reduce your fee, uh, or if there is a slight fee, charge it to me, right? So the, you know, there are these arrangements of this kind, and and you'd have to be able to enter this universe, as I said, anecdotally in in that way. But these are fundamental problems that persist. So the question for you is that I don't really want to because um, you know we don't we don't really have the luxury of being able to do a detailed analysis of some of the stories here. But are there any questions that anyone has? Because that might be one way to take up a few questions that come up in the novel that anyone has from any of the sto from uh, anything that you read uh, uh, here. You know, the, the, the person, for example, who uh, one of the most interesting stories and troubling stories is uh, about the man who uh, has the bear. Uh, and the bear is um, the animal through, through which he uh, makes his living because the bear does these dances. And I can tell you incidentally that when I was growing up in India, this was quite common that every three or four days uh, a man with a bear would show up in the alley that we lived, uh, would announce his presence, and then all the children would go running out, and then all the mothers would start screaming, just keep away from the bear, just keep away from the bear. You know, but you can watch the bear. And then, of course, nobody was thinking about animals' rights, frankly. Uh, in, in the 1960s and 1970s. Uh, and then sometime around the late 1970s, line, 1980s, uh, animals' rights activists started to make their appearance uh, in India and said, oh, this is really degrading uh, to animals. 
uh, to which some people said, yeah, but maybe we should think about the much more degrading condition of human beings. That was one response, right? Uh, they, I mean, there's a very interesting question here, which again, I'm just simply laying out for you, not really, not really addressing uh, fully, but it's a question that r really has repercussions in every domain of life, which is, to what extent were the concerns of the West simply transplanted onto countries such as India, Pakistan, or Bangladesh. That is that, you know, you, you, there were human rights activists who started getting active here in the 1960s. Uh, and then 10 years later, you find these human rights activists now cropping up in India. And you could say that that's a very good example of how ideas get transplanted from one culture to another. Uh, but I don't think it's that simple, because when we get to the question of feminism, this became a fundamental issue, that there were Indian feminists who were actually arguing that there are certain, that A, that we need to understand that there are feminisms, not feminism, okay? And that we cannot, we cannot take the concerns of white women in this country, for example, particularly well-to-do white women, and then simply use the issues around them and the way they frame them to try to understand the condition of women in India. So that's what I mean by the whole question of transplanting certain sets of ideas from one context to another. Uh, but certainly, I can tell you that this is how it appeared when we began to look at such things as um, human rights, uh, um, uh, uh, animal rights, uh, and uh, you know, uh, activists who became fundamentally interested in those kinds of issues. All right, so are there any questions that anyone has? Because if not, then I'm going to really move on to uh, the whole segment of gender, which is going to take up the rest of the lecture today and um, on Thursday. Yes, Dominic, you had a question. Uh, I wasn't sure for the first story, yeah. what thematically it was aiming. All the others, I could sort of see what the author was Well, there's a, there's a bear that appears, right? That's, that's the link. So now the question is, how does one interpret the link? So for those of you who read, this, uh, read the novel, you know that in the first story, there's a father who goes with his son, visits the Taj Mahal, okay, and then they're coming, coming out of Agra, uh, and there's, they've stopped at this intersection, there's a red light, and then the bear appears, right? Starts pounding. So, what's your take? I know you posed the question, but you must have some thought about it. because there's that moment uh, when he's in uh, one of the you know, sites and the guy who is the actual bear handler basically tells him off for the kid yeah. being somewhere where he shouldn't, says that it sort of essentially puts a curse on the kid. Yeah. Uh, and then you know, at the end of the story, he suddenly sort of drops dead. Yeah. Um, and so like, that, that, was, that was my only guess, was that this was essentially sort of like a cautionary tale about that kind of, uh, that, that kind of worldview, but I, okay. I wasn't sure. All right. I mean, a plausible reading. A plausible reading. Uh, does anyone else have a reading of that? At all? Yes. I kind of thought of it as I, I thought of it. I read it a little bit like him, but I also thought it like they were both displaced from India mentally and physically. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that, that displacement is what ends up killing the kid because the kid is a lot more displaced. Yeah. Than the, than the father was. That the father was. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you see, I, I think I think uh, you're moving in uh, in the direction that you, you that one would need to move into, uh, in order to understand what that story is doing there. Uh, see, it, uh, displacement is I think a good word to use here, because all of these stories have to do, in some sense, with displacement. Okay, they have to do with the fact that humans are displaced from the human condition to begin with, and then of course it has to do with, dis with displacement, that is that people moving from one place to another, and very often having to leave behind their families. Look at the guy who's with the bear, and he leaves behind his family, right? And he displaces himself. That the labor market compels you to displace yourself. Now that's the nature, of, by the way, of working class employment in most parts of the world. I think I spoke to you about this in this class. All you have to do is go to any semi-wealthy portion uh, of uh, the uh, Los Angeles County and Ventura County and just look at who the gardeners and all the housekeepers are. Where are they coming from? 
right? So I think that that its displacement is one trope. I, I would introduce another trope, which I think should be should be helpful: anxiety. Okay, that there's a there's an anxiety that is created. You know, you've got this middle class man, at least middle class man, with his son. You know, you go to the Taj Mahal, then you're seated in the car, and you know you're at this intersection, and then suddenly this bear looms up there. Okay. Um, it has to do with the anxieties of the middle class. What he's, what he's looking at is how is it that anxieties have been generated um, in, this, in the middle class here. It's not fundamentally, by the way, necessarily a story about the relations between humans and, and animals. Of course not. I mean, the bear t takes up a very little. The, 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 uh, the uh, main story is, is about that, unquestionably, among many other things. Um, um, but not this... Uh, a particular story. Uh, there is also this element of the curse. And for those of you who read one of my blog essays, which I had written about, you know, the, uh, which I pointed your attention to in my email last night, um, it's partly about how certain idioms appear in this culture, which do not appear in another culture. Uh, so just to flesh out the context that I'm really talking about, uh, you, you know, there's a, a woman, uh, Pragnya Thakur, uh, who was granted a seat uh, in the most recent election by the BJP three weeks ago. Now, this woman is frankly a terrorist. All right? She's not been convicted yet of terrorism, but this is unquestion unquestionably true. As far as I'm concerned, the evidence is just overwhelming. And she did spend eight years in jail uh, on this charge of murder and terrorism and conspiracy to murder. Uh, but she was, she's out on bail. Um, and uh, the BJP picked her up and, and said she's going to be the candidate for, ours, uh, for our party uh, in the city of Bhopal in Madhya Pradesh. Now, the interesting thing is that she argues that, um, uh, that a, um, a major police officer uh, who was killed in the 2008 Mumbai attacks, okay? Um, there's a very recent film called Hotel Mumbai, uh, if I don't know if anyone here has seen it, which I think is still playing in a number of uh, theaters. Uh, now, it, it, uh, it, it, uh, the police officer who was killed uh, in this um, while, uh, while defending, um, uh, you know, the Indian territory, if I may put it this way, his name is Hemant Karkare. He was a police officer. Now, he's the one who had been responsible for... for uh, 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 le leading the anti-terrorist squad, which uncovered Pragna Thakur's activities as a terrorist. So it is on account of him that she was eventually confined to jail. So the most astonishing thing is that she said, you know, when she was up, uh, uh, out on bail and then given the seat was that she said that she had placed a curse, Manishapdiya, okay, which is very difficult to, I mean, it sounds... Uh, quite exotic, actually, uh, to an audience over here. But she says, I placed a curse on him, and that's why he died. That's why he was killed, you know? Now, you see, that's, a very in that's, a very, that's, that's an idiom of Indian politics, which is almost impossible to translate, you know? I mean, whatever else you might say of Mr. Trump, he's not going to say, I cursed Robert Mueller, you know, okay? Or Comey, or Comey says, I cursed you know, what, what is this thing called a curse? What's a register of language? What kind of imagination do you need? And this goes back to the, into the Indian epics, to the epic culture. All right? So it's, it's a particular vocabulary which has become part of the political lexicon in India. And, and, and that's in part what is happening here as well, I would argue. You know. All right? Okay. Uh, since there are no other questions... What I want to do now is I want to move to, as I said, this next segment, which is um, a far more complicated segment than might appear to be the case. And what I'm going to do uh, in, my, in my introductory remarks today is to try to lay out some of the more important questions. Um, here is a very broad overview, a very, very broad overview, uh, when we begin to look at the, the question of women uh, in India and South Asia more widely. Uh, and one of the reasons why we look at it is not simply uh, because uh, gender has, is obviously one of the fundamental ways in which one begins to understand um, the human condition uh, and how um, uh, certain institutions are shaped and certain ideas are shaped. Uh, 
Uh, but because women in India and South Asia are unquestionably adversely impacted with respect to education, health, literacy, well-being in the widest sense of the term. All right? um, and I think this will become very clearly established to you uh, either today or on Thursday when we look at such things as, for example, the female-male ratio, um, where South Asia does very, very poorly, uh, or when we look, for example, at the distribution of literacy um, in, uh, in, in the countries of South Asia. Uh, but, but before we move into that in greater detail, just to go through the overview, I want to look at the historical origins briefly of the woman question, as it was called in colonial India. What do we mean by that? Um, and um, what were the particular issues associated with considering women uh, and the nation? So the fundamental question for you here is this. I want you to think through it and keep it in mind uh, as, as you hear me and as you do the readings, which is, how does one explain this interest in women's issues in the 19th century, down to the present day, right? And in the 19th century, these issues are going to include some things which are not really part of the public discourse today. Uh, the most eminent example of that would be sati, uh, which is not really part of the public discourse in India today. Um, and today, if we're looking at women's issues, I mean, just to give you, this is a, obviously a, you know, a minuscule portion of the set of concerns that one could have, but by way of illustration would include such things as dowry debts, right? That, that dowry debts uh, say something about uh, the fragility of uh, women in the public sphere, uh, in the household, uh, questions of the safety of women, which again are questions which are paramount everywhere, not just in India, but maybe more particular to South Asia, uh, the role of women in the public sphere, and so on. Okay? Uh, but in the 19th century, these issues would have included such things as widow remarriage, uh, which is not really part of the public discussion today. And so the question before you is, what is this particular relationship between women and the nation, and why is it the case, or how is it the case, that women become the embodiment of the nation, right? Women become the embodiment of the nation. You know, almost every country, barring, for example, um, Nazi Germany, described itself as a motherland. Nazi Germany was a fatherland, by the way. Uh, in Russia, sometimes that phrase has been used as well, but usually it's the motherland. Uh, but it's not only in that sense that I speak of women as the embodiment of the nation because there is a tacit understanding uh, that women constitute the soul of the nation. Um, now this might be one way in which civilizations have dealt with this particular because you sort of put them on a pedestal, they become the soul of the nation and then to help with their body, right? That might be one way in which many countries have really worked it out, uh, to put it in crass terms. But you, you see why I'm putting it as a provocation because that's precisely what you're going to find uh, in many countries, right? So uh, what are the historical origins of this in colonial India? Uh, what is the relationship between women and the nation? Okay, and then of course if we're looking at it from the point of view of the vantage point of the present, then there are these kinds of issues such as dowry debts, safety of women, women in the public sphere. Um, and then we have to consider very briefly what is the nature of the women's movement in contemporary India? Um, and issues of economic independence and political advancement. You know, that's obviously a great deal, so there'll be, I'll be quite selective in what I really speak about uh, when I look at the whole question of women in South Asia and in India in particular. Now, let's go back to India, colonial India, 19th century. And I want to begin with this proposition. This is not something you'll find in the reading, so this is an, an, an argument that I'm really advancing for your consideration, um, which is that by the late 18th, early 19th century, let's say circa 1800, okay, for the sake of convenience, a view had developed which said that you judge a civilization by how it treats its women. You know, if you look, for example, just, just so that you understand how this is played out today. 
and I may have mentioned this before to you, but if you look at, for example, something like the UNDP report, so that's the United Nations Development Program. They issue a report annually. And what, is, what, what does that report do? So you, incidentally, if you're looking at this table here, uh, th this is not the entire table because it only gives you the countries ranked at the bottom. And you, know, you can see Bangladesh, Pakistan, India. So the figures on the left are, are from the United Nations, 2018 figures on the right. The right side table is from the World Bank. Uh, basically says the same thing from 2017. Um, but the female-male ratio is one of the ways in which uh, you, you look at where a civilization stands, a country in this case. Uh, you look at the literacy rate. You look at maternal mortality rate, infant mortality rate, number of hospital beds for 100, every 100,000 people. What percentage of the population has access to safe drinking water? what percentage of the population has access to electricity, and so on. I think you get the point, right? These are various kinds of indices that you use, and when you say that this is where a country is on the scale of development. Now, in, now the word development wasn't used in 1800. It was the scale of civilization. It was an evaluative scale. And fundamentally, the argument became that the position of women would be the linchpin for deciding how one were to place civilizations in relationship to each other. All right? And in the early 19th century, in the early 19th century, the colonial state in India came to the view that India did not treat its women very well, to put it mildly. And therefore, of course, that India belonged on the lower end of the evaluative scale of civilization. Okay? And of course, you, you, one of the presuppositions there was, because you might say, well, why, why, why should it be women? And you could say that, well, it's very simple, because that's 50% of the population. But why not men? Why not, look, why not look, for example, at how it treats its men, or how it treats its children, or how it treats its cows or dogs? You know, or X, Y, Z, right? Why women? Be and, and the reason for that in part has to do with this fundamental idea, the second idea now there, which is that women are the embodiment of the nation, right? They, they represent the nation. They speak for the nation, for the soul of the nation, for what is the essence of that nation. And therefore, if the women are in a degraded position, therefore that suggests that the nation itself is degraded. And I have to tell you that if you look, for example, at, um, let's say, the U.S. discourse on Afghanistan in, in the year 2000, yeah, so after, let's say just shortly after, in fact, 2002, after the 2001 bombings, September 11th bombings, uh, the, that was a fundamental argument. That, you know, that, that the condition of women in Afghanistan is degraded. And this perforce must be one reason why we must interfere in Afghanistan. Okay? And we came, I, I'll have to take questions later on. Yeah, okay? That, it, it, this, this, this is uh, an argument that was very much part of what I would call the public discussion. Right? And, and there were, you know, there's a very interesting feminist sort of rejoinder because there were feminists who understood that, yes, the pretext is we want to smoke out the Taliban, we want to get bin, bin Laden, you know, but, but it was understood that there is this lurking argument, sometimes openly stated in, in foreign policy documents, in state policy documents, uh, and by, by conservative hawks at institutions such as the American Enterprise Institute, which said that, well, you know, look, we need to do something to rescue these women, you know. But, but, there, were, but there were others who didn't put it in quite that language, but, but tacitly meant that, you know, all right? And this, of course, goes back, I'm suggesting to you, to the early 1800s. Um, and what you're going to find is, in the 19th century, you're going to find an inordinate emphasis, extraordinary emphasis, on what become 
known as women's issues. For example, the question of female infanticide. Right? That there were certainly communities in India where female children were neglected. So there are three options there. There are three possibilities. And, and the Amartya Sen reading uh, that we have from this book, the chapter that you have on the female male ratio and all of that, uh, actually talks about it, uh, that you can talk about uh, uh, the, the female um, um, being aborted, uh, OK? Uh, the fetus, female fetus being aborted. Uh, you, know, they, you know, there is a test called amniocentesis. Now, amniocentesis is a test which allows you to do sex selection before birth. So uh, when the woman is still pregnant, you can, she can have a test done and she can determine the sex of the child. Now, if you go to Indian hospitals, they are required by law to state, and there's a plaque right at the entrance, this hospital does not conduct any amniocentesis tests. Because what they found, I'm talking about the present, okay? I, and I'm talking about the last 40, 50 years, and then I'll go back to the early 19th century again. In 1970s, there's a hospital in Bombay called Jaslok Hospital, where there were approximately 30,000 uh, uh, fetuses that were aborted. And guess what? Every single one of them was female. Every single one. Okay. So you could have you could have the female fetus being aborted, or you could have f girls being killed shortly after birth. That's that's a second possibility because what is what is the problem that Amartya Sen is thinking through in the reading that you have. Right, so you have from the book by him and Drez, and then also that article, 100 million women are missing, right? And then the literature around that, right? So the, the problem that he's looking at is why is a female male ratio in India? So if you go to the female male ratio, why is it so low? One of the lowest in the world. And most of South Asia has that problem. Uh, we already looked at that table, Pakistan, Bangladesh. Um, Nepal does not, by the way, but that's a complicated problem because then we'd have to look at, because some people have argued, well, this is a problem with Hindu society. Well, if it is, and Nepal is also a predominantly Hindu nation. In fact, it's the only other country that's predominantly Hindu. Then, then why don't you have that problem in Nepal? All right, so you won't find Nepal anywhere on that chart at way down that low. It's, it's much higher up. The female-male ratio is very good there, okay? But in India, it declined from 972 females to 1,000 males in 1901 to 935 females to every 1,000 in 1981, which, meant, which, which means that if you go simply by female-male ratio, then the condition of women in India was declining, okay, was declining. And the figure went up to, to 940 to 1,000 in 2014, but the more recent figures from the UN suggest that it may be going down again, you know. So you could say that female f fetuses are being aborted. Now, Amartya Sen points out that that may have been the case, for example, in the 1970s, but that in fact actually, and of course we know that the laws can be subverted. We know that there are clinics where you can go and you can get uh, an amniocentesis test done, and then if you find out that you're going to have a girl, you have, uh, you have an abortion. Uh, right? We know that that's certainly very much possible. But, but in fact, actually, according to the data that we have seen, about, if you look at the data of live births, uh, the, the figures would suggest that that's not where the problem is. The problem is that, that m most of these girls are dying from neglect immediately after birth or in the years ahead. Okay? And the years ahead. All right? That's, that's where fundamentally the problem is. Now, this was a problem that was not in this kind of detail, obviously. Uh, this was a problem that was already being identified uh, in the 19th century when colonial reports began to appear about female infanticide. 
right? So that was what was considered a, an issue particular to girls and women. The other issue had to do with widow remarriage. Uh, and if you're wondering what that is about, very simply it is the case that if you were uh, a member of an upper caste Hindu community in some parts of India and in upper caste communities, uh, if a girl uh, or a woman, uh, I say the word girl as well because some of these marriages were contracted when the girl was, had not even achieved the age of puberty. So she really is a girl at that point. Um, that if she lost her husband, okay, then, according to the norms of that upper caste community, she could not marry again. She had to remain a widow the rest of her life, right? And which it had other implications. Uh, and again, this is not uh, this is not something that you encountered, for example, in low caste communities. This was something that you encountered most frequently in upper caste communities, and particularly in certain Brahmin you know, community. So this was the question of widow remarriage. So you have a younger, you know, hypothetical case, uh, but you can actually see such report cases being reported uh, in, uh, in, in the reports that were prepared by officials. A girl who's six years old, she's been married off. Usually, by the way, when, when a girl has been married off when she's six years old, uh, she doesn't go and stay in her in her husband's family. Uh, typically the idea was that you only went and started living with your husband once you had achieved puberty, okay? Uh, not, not, before, not before the attainment of puberty. Uh, so it could be, uh, 10 would usually be the earliest, could be a little bit later, obviously. Uh, so uh, she's six, six years old, uh, and then she's informed by her father that her husband, whom she's never even seen, but she's been married off to him, uh, has died of a snake bite or cholera or whatever, right? And now she's a widow, and she's a widow for the rest of her life. So that, so that was the issue of what is called widow remarriage, because there are social reformers who, in the 19th century, began to argue that these were fundamental problems that had to be addressed. Okay, uh, and so they had to they had to take this up as matters of legislation. Um, the, the the reason they had to be taken up as matters of legislation was because if it was customary in a community, simply the view of the colonial state and the Hindu social reformers. So we're not only speaking about the colonial state; we're speaking about these colonial social reformers, who very often are actually instigating the colonial state to live up to your responsibility right? Um, that these Hindu social reformers are saying we may need the force of legislation uh, in order to be able to make some headway in that. Uh, and there are all of these heroic stories, by the way, uh, if you look at this 19th century literature uh, of Hindu social reformers uh, who would very often, um, as one way of signaling their intervention, made it a point to marry only widows. Okay, they'd say, we'll marry you, if no one else will, to a, a young girl who had become a widow. Uh, then there was a the question of female education. Um, and again, you have to remember that, that many of these issues were issues that were not particular to India. There are different variations of that in England itself. Female education was certainly a problem in England because uh, in the mid 19th century, girls were not being educated in England at all. Uh, and if you've, and I'm sure there's someone in this room, maybe several of you who have read the novels of Jane, Jane Austen, but you know how much their discussion there is about the whole issue of a woman being married because the supposition was, well, that's the only thing that a woman really needs to think about in life. You know, and otherwise you're the word that is no longer used today, but you're a spinster if you don't marry. That was a pejor highly pejorative word, right? Uh, so there was this question of female education, anxieties, of course, over female sexuality. So which was one reason why in some communities in particular, the insistence was that as soon as a girl achieves puberty, okay, um, she must be married off. Because then it's some, because otherwise there's a whole question of the regulation of female sexuality. Uh, and then, of course, there was a problem of sati, which is the practice, I think I mentioned that briefly in this class before, the practice of widow immolation. Uh, widow immolation, the, the institution of sati, uh, the numbers are very, very small. But it was precisely because each of these instances was so dramatic. There's actually quite an extraordinary literature of, uh, over it because you'll find a European traveler uh, um, traveling through India 
let's say in 1820, and they witness a sati. And actually, if you look at this, if you look at that, the travelers uh, record, there is a kind of a morbid fascination with what's happening because you know some man has died, uh, and there is a funeral pyre on which his body has been placed. Um, you know, among Hindus as a cremation, right? And then the woman, is, is, you know, is going to go and sit in the funeral pyre along with the body of her dead husband and burn to death, right? Uh, and, and, and their colonial uh, records document this in minute detail. I mean, we know exactly how many satis there were in such and such district of Bengal in the year 1810, 11, 12, 13, 14, whatever, you know, it, averaging out to, let's say, about uh, giving you a, a approximate figure of about 500 per year uh, uh, that, the, that the parliamentary papers really speak about. Uh, but it was not the numbers here. It was, it, was the sh it, was, it was what was considered to be the most heinous offense, right? The, the, something that was simply could not be understood uh, within the conventions uh, of what you might call British thinking. Um, and so there is a literature on that. And in 1829, sati was abolished in the territories of British India, okay, in 1829 by legislation. Uh, now, in the second half of the 19th century, you have these uh, these women's reform movements. So, you know, you have the abolition of sati in 1829, but then in the second half of the 19th century, these debates move on to such things as a controversy over the age of consent bill. The, the age of consent bill simply, uh, simply is what is the age at which a girl or a woman can be viewed as giving her consent to lawful sexual intercourse, okay? Uh, mm, uh, or the age of consent for marriage. And then these debates over widow remarriage that had really begun, as I said, back in the 1830s and 40s, but then persisted for, for, several, for several decades. All right? So this is the backdrop in colonial India in the 19th century. Now there's a complicated literature here which looks at what is called the resolution of the women's question, which I don't want to really enter into at the moment, I, but I want to give you a glimpse of the problem that that historians and social scientists have been thinking about when they look back at the late 19th century, uh, when they think about what I'm calling the resolution of the woman's question. And that had to do with a problem that began to emerge that, that in many of these uh, uh, countries such as India, and this problem was not particular to India, but we're looking here at India, uh, and, and in many parts of India which were particularly under British rule, uh, many of the social reformers said, well, we must look to the West. We must emulate the West. But there was one problem in looking to the West, particularly as the 19th century moves on, and now you're in the late 19th century and in the early 1900s now. What was that problem? That the emancipation of women in the West was posing problems for the West itself. You know, I mean, I know that today it sounds almost comical, but you should really look at the debates in 1900 when women began appearing in trousers for the first time. I mean, you won't believe how many articles there are in common newspapers and magazines, you know? And there was an intense debate whether this is proper for women to do that or not, you know? And of course, if women started smoking in the public sphere, drinking, all of these issues started to coming about. So in, in India, the concern was, well, you know, we want to emulate. We want to emulate the West because clearly women have advanced. Well, they, and, and so then some social reformers said, well, yeah, but do we really want that kind of advancement? Do we want our women wearing trousers and drinking and smoking, you know, and appearing in bars or saloons, right? right? Do we really want that, you know? So they had to really start thinking through it. And so essentially what the social reformers did was, and political thinkers in the late 19th century was, they said that we need to make a distinction between the material sphere and the spiritual sphere. You see that our women should be able to go out into the public sphere, but they should retain the values 
of the East, so to speak. Okay, they should retain the values of the East. So, in other words, we need to we need to understand how this advancement of women has taken place in the West, and to some extent, we should emulate it. But we should also understand that women are the spiritual repository of the nation. So we have to make sure that these women who go out into the public sphere, that they, they do not lose the essence of the nation with them when they go out into the public sphere. So this, this is how the debate is going to be cast. You know, so you make a split between the sphere of the home, the sphere of the world, the inner world, the outer world. So there's this fantastic novel uh, written by Rabindranath Tagore called The Home and the World. And it's partly about that, the home and the world, the domestic sphere, the, the, or what you might call you know, the interior sphere and then the outer sphere, the outer world. Because there are always risks when a woman goes out into the world outside. Right? That was the concern here, fundamentally. Right? Now, there, it is also the case that you do begin to find, when you, when you find the emergence of women in the public sphere, partially facilitated, of course, by, by higher education, among other things. Uh, the Indian independence movement has something to do with, uh, particularly given the nature of the movement in India, that it was a movement led by, led by Gandhi. Uh, and uh, there was an emphasis on nonviolence, and the supposition was that women could have a huge role to play in this. Uh, in fact, in fact, Gandhi was quite firmly persuaded that women were much better practitioners of nonviolent resistance than men were. And so, one of the things you find if you look at the 1920s and 30s, 40s, is you find a large number of women who had thus far been confined to the home, who now start to come out into the public sphere. So you see women leading independence movements, agitations, uh, and you know, if you look at these, if you look at the last portion over there, you see women who are going to assume um, major positions of political leadership um, beginning in the 1920s and moving into, of course, uh, independent India. But they were also women who were part of the revolutionary movement. So they're women who take up arms, um, and they had some role to play in the armed revolutionary movement. Uh, and even in the movement that I have talked about in this class before, which is uh, the Telangana movement of 1946 to 51, which was a movement led by communists um, in Hyderabad. You might remember the whole problem of the integration of Hyderabad uh, into the Indian Union uh, and the fact that it was a state ruled by uh, a Muslim uh, ruler uh, who was also supported by a private militia. Right, so the, the Telangana movement. There's a book called "We Were Making History," which is a, quite an extraordinary account of oral histories of women in this Telangana movement. All right. So I'm saying, as you move into the 20th century, the mid, the early decades, and the mid 20th century until the 1940s, early 1950s, you find women coming into the public sphere partly on account of the independence movement and Gandhian modes of nonviolent resistance, and yet other movements who have been mobilized uh, largely by the communists. Um, all right, I think that that would be the best, really, best way really to encapsulate the role of women uh, at this point in time. Now, um, we move to the post-1947 period. Okay, uh, and I could give you a whole array of data, which I don't plan to because you can find that in the Sendres book. Uh, I've already spoken to you uh, about the female male ratio uh, and the question that Amartya Sen really poses, <coughs> which is how have all of these girls or women gone missing? Okay, um, just going to, uh, uh, I'm not going to say much more about that because uh, this table here, which I'll share with you, gives you the, the ratios and you get a better sense of how acute the problem is uh, in India and in Pakistan. Uh, and of course in Bangladesh as well, uh, uh, but to a much lesser degree. So if you look at this over here, so this figure on the left here, this column where the cursor is, uh, this is 101.86 males to every 100 females. So you can see, and then if you go down to Pakistan over here, you find 101.5, 105.63 males to every 100 females, and then uh, in India it's 107. Uh, 0.62, right? Um, so I think you have a sense of the problem, and I've already tried to suggest to you 
Uh, there are lots of complexities that Amartya Sen introduces into this picture here because uh, this is something that again has been addressed in this class in different ways that uh, it's very difficult to generalize for India as a whole because if you look at the state of Kerala, uh, there you find that the female-male ratio is equivalent to the female-male ratio in countries such as Sweden um, uh, and Norway. Uh, where the number of females exceeds the number uh, of males. And one of the interesting points that, that Amartya Sen makes um, is that these ratios are particularly surprising uh, in view of the fact that all over the world, more males are born than females. But males are much more vulnerable, both in the fetus and at birth. It's the weaker sex. That's basically what he's saying, that men are, in fact, the weaker sex, which is one reason, right, why that females have a much greater rate of endurance. That's fundamentally what he's arguing. If you had to put it in a more political language, I don't know why he doesn't have sort of say that that's really what we're speaking about, because it puts a different political complexion um, on the argument. But that's fundamentally uh, the presupposition that he's really working with with respect to that uh, piece of data. Okay, uh, because if that is the case, then you have to, you know, really wonder what happened to these ratios, okay, uh, over a period of time. That's what he's trying to establish here. All right, now, what I really want to do, um, and I don't have time because I have to return the papers to you, but I just want to set it up. That's all. And then on Thursday, I'm going to spend time fundamentally on these three and allied comments to really round up my discussion of the question of gender. I want to look at the Shabano case, which is a case having to do with maintenance, or if I may use the American word, alimony, for a Muslim woman who is divorced by her husband, and why this became such a critical question uh, in India in the late 1970s, 1980s. They were going to look at the question of bride burning uh, and the question of dowry debts, uh, which was a fundamental problem. It doesn't appear on the newspapers now. I don't think it means that the problem has disappeared. Uh, it may have been alleviated to some degree, certainly, uh, partly because of more stringent exercise by the state, but it may also have been obscured by other problems. And this has to do with the question of women being burnt uh, to death, uh, although the murder is usually disguised as an accident. Um, and you know, we're talking about 2,000, 2,200 cases every year at its height uh, in the 80s and 90s. And then I want to look at a controversy on which I've written a couple of essays, and you were assigned one of them. And that is an, a controversy that has arisen uh, in recent months. Uh, about the entry of women um, uh, of menstruating age from the ages of 10 to 50 uh, into a temple in South India where were, they were not permitted and then the Supreme Court ruled last year that they ought to be permitted. All right, so those are the three cases that we're going to look at on Thursday. All right. And don't run away because I've got your papers for you. <laughs>